Hi, my name is Jenny Lee. I am a production engineer at Meta. I also have with me our hardware and network experts, Kishore and Adi. And we are delighted to talk to you today about the infrastructure that powers Gen AI training at Meta. AI training at scale is not new to us. Before Gen AI, our focus was mainly on training recommendation systems such as ads, feed, and ranking. It was training at scale, but the scale was different, with a massive number of models requiring anywhere between 8 to 500 GPUs. These models ingest a lot of categorical data to make accurate recommendations that are used in the majority of Meta's products. One of the biggest shifts we experienced with Gen AI training, and Llama 3 in particular, was the sheer scale of computation required to train a single model. Llama 2 was trained on just 2 trillion tokens, while Llama 3 is at 15 trillion high-quality tokens. Unlike ranking use cases, where we had numerous small to medium-sized training jobs, Gen AI training is characterized by a few but incredibly large jobs requiring thousands of GPUs that are actively used for months to complete the training. This shift has posed new challenges and opportunities to optimize our infrastructure at every layer in the stack. We worked on improving performance and reliability of hardware, investing in high-throughput, low-latency network and storage, adding flexibility to our scheduler to be able to run not only thousands of smaller jobs, but also one massive training job. And of course, a lot of work went into software to efficiently utilize all given compute resources. These components are essential in meeting the demands of Gen AI training. All this was done while heavily relying on open source tools like PyTorch because it enables us to have rapid research to production development cycle. Our ultimate goal is to make training models that require thousands of GPUs as simple as training ones requiring just a few. This massive number of, of GPUs is needed to finish the training within a feasible time frame while increasing the amount of training data and to handle the complexity of the model itself. To achieve that, for the Llama 370B parameter model, we used various types of parallelism. We had pipeline parallelism, where the model is split into different stages, each of which can be processed on different devices concurrently. The tensor parallelism, where we split individual tensors. This means that operations on large tensors can be performed in parallel by distributing the computations across multiple devices. And of course, data parallelism, where different subsets of data are processed simultaneously across data parallel groups. It's particularly important to speed up training for large amounts of data. The synchronization point at the end of the training iteration is called all reduce. It takes data from all groups, aggregates the results, and shares them back with every node in the system. This has significant implications for our infrastructure as a whole. And this drives very different design requirements. Let's look at this graph. It shows training performance of the same 70 billion model. It was just another evening. The model was training just fine, but then this happened. We saw a 50% performance degradation. The synchronization point I mentioned earlier will keep the entire training job waiting on the slowest GPU until it finishes assigned computation. The issue was eventually found to be caused by GPU number 6 on a host 535, which was feeling hotter than others, and it was hit with a thermal throttling event. After removing the host from the training and tuning thresholds for our automation, the performance has immediately recovered. This was just a glimpse into what it took to keep the Llama 3 models training. It was many more long evenings and dozens of weird edge cases, which are just not consequential at a smaller scale. This brings us to a critical aspect of large-scale training, dealing with hardware slowness or failures. As we increase the number of GPUs in a job, the likelihood of an interruption 
due to hardware failure also increases. This underscores the importance of two key factors, hardware reliability and fast recovery on failure. And with that, I'll pass it over to Kishore to talk specifically about hardware. Okay. Thank you, Jenya. My name is K.R. Kishore, and I'm a hardware systems engineer at Meta. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the hardware aspects of building the Gen AI cluster and taking it to production. I'm happy to represent this work on behalf of a large team that has contributed in so many ways. So what changed? Meta has been building AI clusters for a while. Previously, we focused on ranking and recommendation models, and the clusters there were about 4K or so, and the jobs themselves were about 128 to 512 GPUs in, the, in that range. Now, when GenAI came along, a lot of things changed in terms of the requirements. The sheer size of the cluster had to grow quite significantly, and the compute requirements changed significantly. For prefill, we needed higher compute capacity. For decode, we needed higher memory bandwidth. And the scale out and scale, scale up communication requirements went up significantly as we introduced new forms of parallelism that Jenya mentioned. So when we took all these requirements and then built a cluster with of 24K, and then we're going beyond that as uh, you know as we scale up in this area. So what's so hard about it, right? So you know just go buy a bunch of GPUs and then you know put them in a data center. What's so hard? Well, not so easy. First and foremost, just procuring the supply and secure, securing it in a way that we can get the supply reliably and scale is not easy. There is a single vendor out there who has a premier product and there are many, many people who are trying to build this. So just the supply engineering around all this is a challenge. Then we have to fit this into our existing data center because the lead time on building data centers is quite large. And we have to now take the data centers that were built for past compute workloads, which is the general compute, where Meta has tens of millions of servers, and get that in, get the new GPUs in those data centers. How do we, how do we build this? What are the uh, DC constraints in terms of space, power, cooling? And then once we do it, how do we materialize and maintain it and grow and you know, meet the SLAs of our customers, the product groups, the AI engineers who are actually going to use this and build products that you all can enjoy. So, okay, how did we solve this? So now the North Star for us here is to get the largest scale of the highest density interconnected compute within the constraints of budget, power, and many other physical constraints. So we also had a huge schedule challenge, right? We had to do this as soon as possible because this area is evolving so much that we had to get it all done as fast as possible. So we took a project or a chassis that was done for a ranking and recommendation originally, then we adjusted that, and that was the Grand Teton platform. We changed the compute from 500 watts to 700 watts to extract more computational props. Then we changed the HBM skew on that to get a higher memory bandwidth. And as we did this, it's we had to adjust the power limits, the cooling limits, and other requirements for the chassis rack and row. Now, we can't just go on turning up the fans because if you do that, then you might hit the DB limits within a data center there where protection is needed for operators and such. So we have to balance all these types of unforeseen challenges in trying to get up, get this type of a chassis up and running. So what does it look like now, right? The Grand Teton from outside looks the same as before, but the internals are quite a bit different. Because of the new requirements, the underlying thermals and the mechanical designs had to change, and various validations had to be done to meet these new specs. So this has eight GPUs within a chassis and 16 GPUs in a rack, and we roll out into a number of racks in a row. Well, like I mentioned, like because of the power and other limits, we had to figure out how to place this in a way that the data center can operate in the most dense format in the terms of the compute density that can be achieved, and also in terms of the network capability and the cooling limits. So if you look at the picture on the left, which was done for the previous clusters, you can see a mix of both GPUs and computes evenly distributed, and the supporting services provide things like general compute and storage and so on. 
Whereas when you went look at the picture on the right, you will see a lot more GPUs. And doing this meant moving supporting services out and readjusting where things are and figuring out how the highest density cluster can be built. So once we land all this, what happens, right? The operationally, you have to manage this large cluster. And as Jenya mentioned, these are operating in a synchronous manner, which means that a job starts on a large cluster, say about 8K or 16K or so on, and they all have to be alive for the job to complete. If the job does not, one of the GPUs or some of the GPUs fail, then the entire job comes to a screeching halt. So this is fundamentally because there are, as you increase the number of GPUs, the incidence of failures increases and the mean time between failures will reduce. So beyond all this, what you see is unforeseen problems. For example, when those jobs suddenly stop, the power drawn from the grid just drops. And then you'll get a call from the utility company saying, hey, what are you doing here? Like spiking this power up and down. And we have to manage and modulate all of these things. So we measure all of this by essentially creating an efficiency metric where we take the total training time and remove all the time needed for essentially administrative work, which is creating checkpoints, restoring from checkpoints, time lost from the last checkpoint to the time of failure. How do you detect the failure? How do you manage and mitigate? All of this is a big part of the challenge of operating a cluster like this. So what type of problems did we see? So there are a number of problems that you can see. You know, beyond, I'm going to talk mostly about the hardware types of failures here. And one of the highest incidents of failure which you see is like GPUs falling off the bus. What does this mean? GPUs just cannot be detected from the CPU on the PCI bus. This could be for a variety of reasons. And you can see GPU drivers stuck, or you can see DRAM errors or SRAM errors. These are uncorrectable errors that can cause some mitigation. In many of these cases, we have to work with the vendor because these are we are at the bleeding edge here, and the vendors have never seen problems at this because they've never deployed at this scale. And only when you do this, we'll see types of failures. So just working with the vendor, finding mitigations, finding screenings, and so on is a challenge. So given all this, okay, I mean, I'm only talking about problems. Like, how did we do? Where are we now, right? So thanks to the great work done by the team, and it's a testament to the engineering effort and to all the support that we've gotten from our vendors and partners, we are in a pretty good place where we are now at about 95% of efficiency. Of the, and that means that on the Llama 73B model, when we measure on a 24-hour rolling window basis, we can use 95% of the time effectively. So this is the where we are. And of course, we want to get better. And as we continue working on this and adopting new technologies, liquid cooling, new GPUs, new compute, there are so many more challenges ahead. But you're going to hear more about communication aspects of this from my colleague Adina, who's going to also talk about the networking aspects of this. And with that, I hand you over to Adi. Thank you. Thanks, Kishore. I'm Adi Gangidi. And in this section, I will focus on network architecture of Chennai clusters. I will also take you through what it takes to produce performant communication on these clusters. We learned from Chenya that Gen AI models need lots of GPUs to train. These GPUs are working in parallel, but they are training a single large model together. So they need to frequently communicate with each other in the form of collective communication operations. Examples of such operations are all reduce or all gather. Such frequent communication requires a network that offers high bandwidth along with low and predictable latency. There are two leading network choices in the industry that fit these requirements. They are Rocky and InfiniBand Fabrics. So what went into weighing these options for Meta? On one hand, Meta had built Rocky clusters for ranking for the past four years. But the largest of those clusters were 4,000 GPUs only. We, however, wanted to build something for Gen AI that's significantly larger. On the other hand, Meta had built research clusters as large as 16K GPUs with InfiniBand. However, 
those clusters were not built in the production environment. So this was a hard trade-off to make. We could not find anyone in the industry that built identical clusters with both of these fabrics for the same application and someone whom we could defer to their experience. So we decided to build both two 24K clusters, one with Rocky, another with InfiniBand. Our intent was to build and learn from the operational experience. These learnings will inform future direction of our Gen AI fabrics. We optimized the Rocky clusters for quick time to build, while InfiniBand cluster for lowest latency and full bisection bandwidth it could offer. We use both of these clusters to train Llama models, with Rocky cluster being used for training the largest model. In spite of these differences between these clusters, we were able to tune both to make sure network is not a significant bottleneck for application performance. Now let us dig into the architecture of one of our 24K clusters. Let us focus on Rocky. The building block of this cluster is a 3K GPU small cluster. It has 192 racks connected by cluster switches and offers full bisection bandwidth within this 3K GPU domain. Each rack has 16 GPUs that are split between two servers. In order to form a 24K GPU cluster, we stamp eight of these 3K clusters within the data center building. Kishore talked about how fitting these clusters in the same building was a tough task. We then connect all these eight clusters via a new layer of switching called aggregation layer to form the overall 24K GPU cluster. The connectivity at this layer is no longer full bisection bandwidth. Rather, it suffers from an oversubscription of one is to seven. This means if all the GPUs in a 3K cluster talk to all other GPUs in another 3K cluster, they would only achieve one seventh of the bandwidth. So let's review now the bandwidth and the latency artifacts of the network design that we just talked about. Highest bandwidth is between the GPUs in the same server connected via scale out NVLink domain. They also offer lowest latency. The next highest bandwidth is between the GPUs in the same small cluster as they have full NIC bisection bandwidth. The least bandwidth and the highest latency is suffered by the GPUs in different small clusters. Now that we know about details of these clusters, how do these clusters perform? The large clusters perform poorly out of the box, both from communication benchmarks as well as Gen AI model performance perspective. In this picture, you can observe that the out-of-box performance was low and variable, especially for large clusters compared to their smaller clusters. But by investing in several aspects of the overall stack, we were able to optimize the performance to be close to roofline performance. So how did we exactly optimize the performance? We optimized three aspects of the overall stack. First aspect is to assign different model and data parallel communication to different layers of network topology. Second aspect is to implement the collective communication patterns so that they can be less latency sensitive. We do this by changing the default implementation of these collectives with custom algorithms, such as recursive doubling or recursive halving, instead of using conventional algorithms like rings. Lastly, just like ranking jobs, Gen AI jobs produce further fat flows that make it hard to distribute the traffic produced by these jobs across all possible network paths. This required us to further invest in network load balancing and routing. For the network geeks in the audience, we already dug deep into rocky load balancing techniques in the last Networking at Scale event. I added a link to the presentation for your reference. Now, let's dig deeper to understand the first aspect here about how we made optimal use of the network by customizing the model sharding layer. Jenya touched on the tensor and the pipeline parallelism as well as data parallelism. The collective communications corresponding to each of these parallelisms have different bandwidth and latency requirements. So we map tensor parallelism to stay within the server, pipeline parallelism stays within the same small cluster, data parallel operations goes across the small clusters. We do this so that the network capabilities that we discussed earlier are effectively exploited. This seems easy in theory, 
But what does it take to do this in practice? We actually do this by teaching the network topology awareness to the job, job scheduler, distributed ML layer, and the collective communication libraries. All of these system software layers make respective decisions based on network topology awareness so that we can result in an optimal parallelism to topology mapping. So in summary, Gen AI workloads have unique scale requirements. We build two 24K clusters to satisfy all of these requirements. We ran into multiple problems highlighted by hardware reliability and performance variability. And solutions to these problems involve full stack optimizations in software, hardware, and network layers. So what's next? We're not done pushing the boundaries of the scale, not yet. In the near future, we'll be training much larger models. These will require an order of magnitude more GPUs, all connected by the same network fabric. We need to deal with the reliability artifacts, as well as longer distances and latency, and how that affects the performance. These are much harder problems, reminding us that we are only the beginning of this journey. As we solve these problems, we want Meta's Gen AI's infra to be a leading example of what's possible. We want to build this solution on open ecosystems and commodity hardware. We believe in making harder problems really together. Many of you listening to this talk may be working on similar Gen AI infrastructure related problems. We'd love to hear more about your own efforts in this direction and compare and contrast ours. Thank you for listening.